I want to say that uh, George Orwell tells the story of doing something, a very mean trick that he played on a wasp. He said that the wasp came onto his plate and began to eat the jam, and Orwell took a knife and cut the wasp in half, and the wasp kept eating the jam. As a matter of fact, Orwell could see the jam run down its esophagus. And Orwell said, not until the wasp tried to fly did it understand the trouble it was in. And that's why I'm speaking to you today on the topic of strengthen what remains. It's actually the words of Jesus to the church at Sardis. And we must understand that um, we're living at a time when the America, even when I came to America 40 years ago or 50 years ago almost, it's a different place. The overreach of government and all the things that you know about, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time telling you things that you already know, is happening. And the America that we once knew, as Francis Schaeffer told us, that America is gone. But God has not left us without a witness. God is sovereign, and Jesus has brought us to this hour. And even as we look at the church in Sardis, I want us to ask the question, what might Jesus say to us today? What might he say to us if he were to write a letter? Now, of course, I realize that the story of Sardis, and I hope that you have your Bibles, I realize today it's not a Bible anymore, it's cell phones, it's you know, iPads, jackhammers, whatever it is that you brought with you. But um, it's the third chapter of the book of Revelation. I want us, I realize that Liberty University, of course, is not a church per se, but I think we'll find applications all the way through this. Now, before I look at the text, I need to tell you that in 2009, I actually was on a tour that visited the seven churches of Revelation, and there is no church in Sardis. There are only mosques. And that motivated me to write a book about the lessons that the non-existent churches of Turkey have to say to the American church. And since it was mentioned that I've written a number, I have to tell you that the title of the book is The Cross in the Shadow of the Crescent. But when you go there to Sardis, you discover something very interesting. There's a fourth century church built right up against a pagan temple. Pagan temple, a brothel, basically. Now, there are two ways to interpret that. One way to say is that the church, the church wanted to be where it was the darkest and say, we're going to plant a church here where the need is the greatest. That's an optimistic way to understand what happened there. But maybe there's a different interpretation. Maybe the church felt at home next to the pagan temple. You could worship in the church and then you could leave and take a couple of steps and you could be in a pagan temple. Now the church that I'm talking about, the ruins are fourth century, so they're not exactly the, the ruins that would have been there during the time of Christ and when this letter was written, but it makes us think about the relationship of the church and culture. With that, I'd like to begin by saying that Jesus says, and this is chapter 3, to the angel of the church, that of course is probably the pastor or a messenger of the church, write the words of him who has the seven spirits of God. Now, of course, you know there are not seven spirits of God. It's the fullness of the spirit. Isaiah 11:2, where the Bible says there's the spirit of wisdom and understanding and the spirit of knowledge. Jesus has the fullness of the spirit and him who has the seven stars. Now, the seven stars are, of course, the seven churches. And Jesus has our churches and our institutions, such as liberty, in his hands. Now, all that by way of introduction. I don't know whether or not a faculty takes notes. <laughs> That's up to you. But what I'd like to do is to give you three words. Three words, and then we're going to go through the text to see what Jesus had to say to this church 
in Sardis. Imagine Jesus taking out time, taking out time to write a special letter to the church. What might he say to our churches or our institutions? First of all, the first word I want to give you is the word rebuke. Notice what Jesus says in the text. I know your works. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. (laughs) Wow. Sardis Church was active. It was busy. Let me say that it was probably the place where people said, when you go to Sardis, that's the church to worship at. But Jesus comes along and sees what no church consultant could possibly see. He puts the stethoscope on the church And the church is dead. Jesus cannot find a heartbeat. And so uh, Jesus said, you know, you have a good reputation, lots of activity, but there's really no spiritual dynamic. There aren't marriages that are being put together, you know, that are falling apart. There aren't conversions, people being converted out of all their sin. You're just going through the motions and you have the evidence that you appear to be alive, but actually, spiritually, you are dead. I have a friend in Germany who said he attended a concert and it involved handbells. So here are the handbell players, they're playing. While it's happening, a drunk walks up down the aisle, pulls the pulls the tablecloth, and of course all the bells go every which way, and the music continues. You've heard of lip sync. Well, this was handbell sync. All the music continued, and you know, sometimes in our churches or in our institutions, that's the way it is. You go through all of the motions, everything is the same as it was, and you have handbell sync, so to speak, and the music keeps playing. But actually, there's no reality. I sometimes ask pastors, and once again, you know my heart is for pastors, but I'm speaking to you as a faculty. I ask pastors this question, what if God wanted to do something in your church that wasn't listed in the bulletin? Would he have the freedom to do that, or is everything locked in, the music is playing? The same kind of schedule happens week after week and day after day. What about that? Are are we having a reputation that we're alive? Could it be that spiritually we are dead? Now, it's very interesting that Jesus does not mention why it is that this church is receiving this rebuke, except he goes on to say, I've not found your works perfect in the sight of God. And as I look at the church today, with its compromises, I begin to think to myself that obviously it seems to me that the real problem of the church in Sardis was they no longer saw the world as an enemy. So they gave the culture and they gave their people what they wanted in accordance with the culture. What might Jesus point out to us today? I see in some instances that the church is compromised doctrinally. Even the gospel sometimes is obscured by various social messages that are out there. And uh, even that sometimes is obscured. You have, for example, moral, moral compromises. I want to speak to that because as I look at the internet and see what's happening, so often people say, well, we can... We can um, affirm same-sex relationships because we have to love everyone. And I need to tell you that love can be evil. Love can be very evil. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, they didn't stop loving. They just started to love the wrong things. Lovers of pleasure, lovers of money, lovers of self. You as a faculty have to help your students understand that love and truth are not enemies. They're not enemies. It's not as if, you know, you have to choose one or the other that, well, let me put it in the words of Jesus. They come to mind as I'm speaking here. If you love me, keep my commandments. 
So what we must do is to help this generation to say that our doctrine is not based on a worldly view of love. It must always be based on the word of God, but of course, in a loving way. We have to put those two together. So I see compromises there. I see compromises racially, where we have imbibed some worldly ideas of the issues of race rather than going to the scriptures and seeing God, what he has to say about it. We are being compromised educationally. That's why Liberty University is so critical. You go to the average university today and they will not even allow freedom of speech. And as you well know, we live at a time of censorship a time of political correctness, a time of wokeness. And then speaking of being compromised educationally, I can't even begin to tell you, I did an investigation as to what our public schools are teaching over there in Illinois. And I have to tell you, it is very frightening. I think of a little eight-year-old boy crying and saying, I'm afraid I might become a girl this transgenderism craze, wherever, if you don't love your body, you're probably trans. Kids are brought to confusion, and that, of course, is the intention of the radicals. So we must understand that we are fighting all of, oh, by the way, I have one other thing. We are in a battle technologically. The cell phone in your teenager's hand will do more to inform his or her worldview than going to church for an hour or a Sunday school class. Technology has changed everything. And we're living in an age in which it just comes at you. You don't even have to go seeking for things. Things come to you. And we know, of course, what is happening is the uh, great effects, negative effects. I know that technology is important. We, of course, use it and all that, the positive side. But I have to tell you, the negative influence of technology is huge and destructive. So Jesus might say to us, uh, I've not found your works perfect in the sight of God. You have given the culture what it wanted. You have submitted to the culture, and whatever, whatever is goes. Last night in the hotel, I wanted to catch some news. And uh, I didn't realize at first that your news is later because of the change in time from Chicago. And as I went through the various channels, violence, all forms of sexualization, all forms of occultism, we cannot allow that to become a part of our lives and think that our works are complete before God. You faculty members have a huge responsibility in helping your students see this in drawing lines in the sand of disciplining in a world that clearly has lost its way. Well, the first word I gave you is the word rebuke. What's the second word? The second word is the word remedy. The word remedy. Jesus gives four commands to the church. The first one is there in verse 2. He says, wake up. Now, of course, he's talking to Christians. I mean, you know, the dead find it very difficult to wake up. By the way, I wasn't going to throw this in, but I used to teach preaching, and I took students to a cemetery and taught them to preach to the dead. <laughs> I did, seriously. I said, this will give you good preparation for being a pastor. <laughs> You're asking the dead to rise. How many miracles can you do? Now, this would take a longer discussion, but then we'd get on our knees and we would pray in the cemetery because every time you preach the gospel, you're expecting the dead to rise, you're expecting the deaf to hear and the blind to see. Miracles we cannot do. But Jesus said to this church, wake up. Wherever I go, there are people who say to me, you know, I attend a church where the people just live in a bubble. It's as if they are unaware of the fact that the culture is collapsing. They're not helping pa parents draw a line in the sand and say, we can do this much, but we can't do, uh, do this, and helping us pay the consequences of our obedience. I find that oftentimes 
people have to wake up because they are in a stupor. And so Jesus says to the church, wake up, face reality. Second, he says, strengthen what remains. Well, what remains is verse 4, for example. Jesus said in the midst of all this, yet you still have a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white. Uh, even everywhere there, God has a remnant of believers. So you strengthen what remains. You encourage them. You encourage others to join them so that you can become strong and you can become a force for good as you get together. And uh, certainly in the midst of all this, you're helping families and you're helping them navigate all of these things. And then Jesus says, remember, this is still verse 3 now, remember what you've received. What have you received? I think of the great heritage of Liberty University. You've received a vision. You've received the gospel, gospel gospel-centered. Wherever I go throughout the country, I meet Liberty grads, pastors, people in vocational work, So you have received a great deal, and he says, strengthen what what you've received. The gospel, the Holy Spirit, you've received all this, and so make sure that you remember it. Remember who you are in the midst of a collapsing culture. Thank God for the past. Thank God for what you have learned, and remember Jesus said what you have received. Remember the gospel, remember the scriptures, and remember I'm with you. Someone has pointed out that the church today, the church today is something like the disciples in John chapter 20. It says that the disciples gather together in the upper room, the doors being locked for fear of the Jews. So there they are in the upper room, and they're fearful because of the Jews. Everybody's asking, who's the first one who's going to walk through this door, and can we open the door? That's what they ask one another. And in the midst of their fear, and that's where we are basically as a church and as Christians, fear of social media, fear of whatever, then suddenly something happens. Jesus shows up in the midst, and everything changes. From there on, the disciples become brave. They're willing to die for Christ. Most of them did, because Jesus is with them, and he is alive. And by the way, Jesus is with us today, even though we can't see him. We know that he's as much with us as he was with the early disciples So in terms of remembering what we have received, we have received the gift of the Holy Spirit, we have received the strength of the Holy Spirit, the wisdom of the Spirit, and of course the very presence of Christ as we navigate this culture. God has not abandoned us. He's not said, well, everything is lost. No, even if we don't reclaim the culture, Jesus wants to reclaim believers who are having the courage to stand against the zeitgeist, the spirit of the times. And then there's another command Jesus gives, and it may be the most important, repent. Repent. You say, well, do Christians have to repent? Well, Luther said that he repented every single day, and we can understand why repentance is necessary. I find in my own life I have to repent, not to be saved again, of course, but I have to repent, I have to turn from sin, I have to acknowledge it, I have to give myself to the Lord and and renew my own commitment. Your president said that the heart of man is deceitful and very wicked, and you and I have no idea of the potential of evil within us, none. And unless we understand that, we're never going to thoroughly repent. You know... Uh, to mention one contemporary issue and to treat it all too quickly, let's talk about critical race theory. What is the basic fundamental 
problem? The answer is, because of an inadequate doctrine of sin, there is an inadequate doctrine of redemption and reconciliation. Uh, because after all, if you don't, uh, well, let's go back to Karl Marx. He divided people, as you know, into the oppressed and into the oppressors. And what we need to do is to acknowledge that all of us are born as oppressors. All of us are tainted with sin. We come into this world with our prejudices. We come into this world. So it isn't just one party that has to repent. It's everybody that needs to repent. And then we meet at the foot of the cross and we ask ourselves, how can we work together going forward for causes of justice and righteousness and reconciliation? So, you know, repentance is something that I have to do regularly. I'll throw this in also at no extra cost. Before I get out of bed in the morning, I always pray this prayer I did this morning. Oh, Lord, glorify yourself in my life today at my expense. May today not be about me. May today be about you and your glory. Repentance. Jesus said, take a good look at yourself in the presence of God and repent. So that becomes very necessary. I think it was Charlie Brown in one of those cartoons who was kneeling beside his bed and said, oh Lord, I'm here to turn myself in. <laughs> and that's what repentance is. We turn ourselves in. Now I've given you two words. One is the rebuke, the remedy, and there's a third word I'm giving you today, and that is the reward. Notice Jesus said this, and I'm picking it up with me. I'll go directly now to verse 5. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments. We can say that that's the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And also, by the way, in the book of Revelation, talking about the church, and the marriage supper of the Lamb, it says that the white garments are also the righteous deeds of the saints. Of course we're saved by the righteousness of Christ. The righteousness of Christ alone. But at the same time, you and I also do deeds that please the Lord. And in the process of pleasing the Lord, we bring him glory. And those righteous deeds are also precious to God. So it says, to the one who conquers... I'm going to give you this. Now, I'm a minority in this, so if all of you disagree, that's fine. But I don't believe that every Christian is going to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I can't imagine it, especially based on some of the parables that Jesus told about faithfulness. But it says this, he who overcomes, this is from the next chapter, he, you know, the same chapter later on, he who overcomes to him I shall grant to sit with me on my throne, even as I overcame and sat with my father on his throne. Think that through. You are sitting on the throne of God. He takes us from the dirt, and we can sit with him on marble. But now let's look at the text, all right? He says, I'm going to give you garments if you're faithful. And then he says, and I won't blot out your name. You have to understand that the imagery is this of a city. And the city was, um, had a roster of everyone who lived there. And if you died, your name was blotted out, obviously. And it's not as if Jesus is saying, I'm going to blot out your name as a threat. No, he's just simply giving a word of assurance and saying, look, be faithful and you don't have to worry. I'm not going to blot out your name from the book of life. Because those who are truly redeemed, I believe, arrive safely in heaven despite the bumps along the way. So Jesus said, uh, if you are faithful, I will not only do that, but look at this. And uh, this is in the text. The one who conquers will be clothed thus with white garments, and I will never blot out his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Can you imagine Jesus confessing my name or your name before the father? 
It's humbling to think that Jesus would say, Father, here's Erwin Lutzer. I redeemed him, and I confess his name in your presence. Jesus said, this is the way faithfulness goes. If you are faithful, this is what I'm going to do. Now, he ends by saying a very interesting verse. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is so critical because, you know, as a farm boy reading the Bible when I was young, I used to say, you know, everybody I know has ears. Here's what Jesus is saying in the communication process, in your classrooms, in your teaching, if you think that you can change people only intellectually because of your knowledge, many of them may be turned off. It will not be transforming because people listen not only with their minds, they have to listen with their hearts. That's why it's so important for you as a faculty member, win the hearts of your students through your friendship, through your relationships, because if not, they will not hear what you are saying. Now you say, well, Pastor Lutzer, this is the exposition. What do we do going forward? How do we parse this out? First of all, let me say, wake up to reality. Now this is very important for you to realize that evil never retreats on its own. It only retreats when it is up against a more powerful force. And above all the political wrangling and all of the things that are happening in our world today, always remember that back of it is a spiritual battle against Satan who wants to destroy, to deceive, to mislead. And that's why we have to spend so much time on our knees because we are up against a spiritual battle and the devil will not back down unless there is a superior force. And you and I know that that force is Jesus Christ raised, seated in heaven. The Jesus that you tell your students about. The Jesus whom you honor in your classrooms. So we have to wake up to reality. We have to wake up to reality. Secondly, each day that you live is either a positive or a negative regarding eternity either gold, silver, or precious stones, or wood, hay, stubble, and most of our lives are a mixture. But every day that you live, and of course, at the age of 80, I think about this often, every day that you live is a gift, and the question that you have to ask is, how effective am I, am, am I today for the sake of eternity? What investments have I made in the lives of others, my students, but also your family and all? Because time is short and eternity is very long. You as a faculty have an impact in the lives of students that is much greater than you will ever realize. God never allows us to see all the good that we do. Elmer Towns, back in 1960 or 61, took a shy farm boy, and I have to say, I was very shy, I did get over it eventually, he took a shy farm boy and encouraged him and said, you have potential, go to Dallas Seminary, and there were some other admonitions he gave me. Now, nobody, if you had known me back there, Nobody could have predicted that someday I would be the pastor of Moody Church in Chicago for 36 years. That was just, you have no idea how God led me from there all the way to there through a series of providences which is written in my autobiography because I wanted to give God glory for things I didn't do for God's unexpected leading. He didn't know that when he encouraged me. And the encouragement that you give to your students as an influencer, you have no idea what God is going to do with them in 10, 20, 30, 50 years. No idea. Be faithful. It's like throwing a stone in the middle of a pond and the ripples go on throughout eternity. 
Be faithful unto death. Don't worry about social media. Push back. I've had that also. We all have. Be faithful unto death, God says, if necessary, to death. And I'll give you the crown of life. You and I are investing in eternity, not just time. And we do it through the influences that God has given to us. And he who has an ear to hear, let him hear. I'm going to pray for you. Father, I want to thank you for raising up Liberty University. I want to thank you for your faithfulness, for all of its development, all of its students, its graduates, its faculty. We ask in the name of Jesus that we might hear your word with clarity, that you're the one that has the seven stars. You have the churches. You have the universities all in your hand. We ask that you'll give us hearts that have only one desire, and that is faithfulness to you to the very end. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you.